And you've had him seen many stories, particularly here on PM Express, about the economic crisis and its impact across the board. What we haven't done yet is assess its impact on food security. In the last one week, we are beginning to hear from those in the industry. Apparently, it is biting hard, and they are warning of an impending food shortage and a food crisis. But really, what is the problem? One of the main sources of this problem that the uh, players in the industry, including farmers, are warning us about is because of the issue with fertilizer. Now, government is telling the farmers that chemical fertilizer is in short supply all around the world, and that indeed is true. We'll prove that to you very shortly. And the shortage the government have explained, it's dating all the way back to the COVID-19 era. And again, if you listen to the Deputy Agric Minister, he zeroes in on the Russia-Ukraine war as partly the reason why we're having this challenge. Let's check that a bit and, and, and show you why this is. If you look at Bloomberg's table here, um, all around the world, this is gaining some attention. I mean, this here is Russia. That's the one in red here. And you would see that apart from Canada, in terms of the world producers of potash, what fundamentally what you need uh, for the fertilizers. Russia is second only to Canada in global supply, right, of 9 million metric tons. Now, Russia has sanctions imposed on it as a result of the, um, its invasion of Ukraine. Now, what that means is that Russia would, of course, because of the restrictions that have been put on it, unable to, to supply to the world what it would normally do in normal times. So the nine, point, the nine million metric tons of what they supply, as far as fertilizer is concerned, is going to be hampered. And when we have a shortage from a major power like Russia in terms of this production and the volume, what you tend to have is that prices will begin to go up. Same reason we've seen prices of oil go up on the market. And, and it's such a fundamental input when it comes to agriculture. And for an economy like Ghana, heavily dependent on agriculture to feed ourselves and to create jobs, you begin to appreciate why this will begin to have a massive impact on people. But this is also happening in the context of a major economic crisis locally, as of course has been brought on by factors both external and local, right? And so, so farmers are going to be spending more on, on fertilizer. And as we know, government had said, because of the tightening of the fiscal, fiscal space, they, do longer, they no longer have money to sponsor and to subsidize uh, fertilizer as much as they would. And so they've slashed the government um, you know, support to, to, to fertilizer for the local farmers. But again, if you stay with the global story, right? If we go to the Green Markets North American Fertilizer Price Index, has risen by 10% in the first week of this, of this month to its highest level since December. That, that is a significant jump, 10% at the global level. We don't produce as much fertilizer here, right? And then we should also see prices for the popular nitrogen fertilizer uh, or urea climbed another 5% uh, in, in New Orleans this week after the record 29% percent jump for the week uh, ending uh, this is february 25 that tells a story <coughs> pardon me tells a story of of what is happening on, around the globe when it comes to fertilizer and that is beginning to have an impact here so prices are going up government subsidy is becoming an issue too and then there are a host of other factors that the ordinary Ghanaian farmer that largely works to put food on your table is having to deal with and that is what I've listed here. You talk about a fuel cost, the cost of fuel. The cost of fuel fundamentally is going to affect the farmer too because the farmers use tractors. They use tractors. Tractors need fuel to operate, and the cost of fuel has gone up. Some of the farmers, they rent the tractors. In fact, many Ghanaian farmers don't have tractors of their own, so they rent the tractors. Those who are renting out the tractors are saying to them, it's going to cost them more to rent the tractor to plow their land. Why? Because those who are renting it are also having to buy fuel at exorbitant prices. Diesel is the most expensive product at the filling stations that you, that you get, right? And so that is beginning to affect the farmer. They are unable now to rent tractors to plow their land. Cost of seedlings going up. We import some of them. Exchange rate questions have come into play here 
because of the cost at which we're importing these seedlings and it's going to affect that. Those that we produce locally, fantastic, right? And then you have, we decide against something that we don't produce locally enough. And so we're getting we decide from abroad. You're importing we decide means you need dollars to do so. The dollar rate and the CD is a question that we've tackled many times here on PM Express. It's affecting that. Pesticides also. So you begin to appreciate that this problem we have with the economy and the global nature of it is beginning to have a very devastating impact on a Ghanaian farmer. And it, it is a very, very big problem. They are beginning to warn us what might happen. Also because of this particular point here with the slashing of the 15% uh, subsidy, right? And we're hearing from the peasant farmers. Majority of our farmers in Ghana are peasant farmers. Right? Smallholder farmers. They've threatened to move away from cereals. They're threatened to move away from production of grains and cereals following this 15% slash of subsidy for fertilizers by the government. It is a catch-22 situation. Government hasn't got enough money to subsidize because of the economic crisis. We simply have no money. The economy is struggling. So government is slashing the subsidy by 15%. At the time, when global prices of fertilizers and the cost of fertilizer is also going up. If the farmers have ever needed fertilizer, they need it more now than ever before. But unfortunately, the time when they need it most is when government too is struggling to raise the funds and the financing. So government says 15% off. So the, 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 the ordinary farmer is having to contend with an increasing cost of fertilizer with less amount of government subsidy on the product. That, that should give you a sense. And we'll be talking to those who retail, um, they sell the fertilizer in the farming input. They'll tell you what's happening with, with the product that they sell to the farmers. They, they also don't have a choice. They have to put the margins on it. Other than that, they're also going to make losses here, right? And so that is the problem the farmers are saying. And this is the, the thing that really worries. If they're moving away from grains and cereals, mostly everything, our staple, the amount of grains and cereal, grains and cereal. If they're not going to produce this, we're going to have a food crisis on our hands very shortly. And that is why we're hearing from the buffer stock company. They are trying now to put in place measures in anticipation of this happening, because this is not going to go away anytime soon. We're waiting for the finance minister to come on Thursday. Hopefully, we might hear some, um, you know, some solutions about this. But in the meantime, this is looming. It's its, a, it's, it's, its own crisis waiting to happen and needs resolution, right? And then you have the government uh, also has revealed it may not be able to meet even the half, half of the budget of fertilizer for this year. We are really in difficult times indeed. And you see, but government has done some, some good work in terms of fertilizer, uh, quantities of fertil organic fertilizers, the quantities of fertilizers distributed in metric tons. That is, the table tells a story, right? 2018 to now, you have, if you look at the 2022 so far, a lot is going out. A lot is going out. 530,000 metric tons gone out. More than we've done in 2020, 2021. More than we've done in 2020. More than we've done in 20, 2019. And more than we've done in 2018. Right? So it's going out. A lot of it's going out already. Except that the cost is really stifling um, these farmers. And so government is asking those who are in the economy who can produce this issue do it try and meet the demands uh, as much as they can. The Met Agency, this is just to, to, to make matters worse, right? To, to add ink source to injury, Met is warning that we're going to have a longer dry season. That is another problem that the farmers have to deal with. And so we're going to be talking about the economic crisis we are currently in and how it's affecting food security with, with the government saying 50% slash in the subsidy. I have the guests to do the job. Um, those really feeling this and those actually doing the business with the farmers who are joining me to have a conversation right after this. Stay with me.
Well, my guest joining me in the studio is Dr. Charles Nyaba. He's the head of programs and advocacy. He's the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. Uh, Edward Carraway is the general secretary of the uh, Ghana Agricultural Workers Union, and he's uh, joining me via Zoom. Uh, Dr. Patrick Asumin is a development economist and uh, uh, joins us uh, via uh, Zoom as well. Um, I also want to get a sense of uh, those who retail the uh, farming inputs, um, how, because they, they would, if government is not there, they will supply to the, to the farmers. And what, what's the, how are they faring to? Because if they feel it, they'll pass it on to the farmers. Uh, Francis Day is the vice uh, president of uh, Glofet Limited Company, and he will also join us because they deal in some of these uh, farming, farming inputs. Uh, Dr. Chachina, but let me start with you. I mean, the, 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 it is obvious what the problems are. Okay. But let me first assess. What is the situation with the Ghanaian farmer now in the wake of everything else that we just learned there, um, the prices going up across the world and, and locally? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Evans. Um, let me say good evening to the farmers who are listening. Um, before I came here, I think uh, most of uh, the platforms where I belong, I put the issue there and they were giving me Feedback. their experiences and then things that uh, we need to put uh, for the public to understand. Now, if you look at uh, our experience in 2021, mm -hmm. that is what is impacting in our current food security situation. Uh, look at the various components that we usually use to do what we call crop budget. The variables, the, the, there were some slight changes in terms of cost and in terms of availability. To do a crop budget, what we do is we look at cost of land, cost of plowing services, cost of labor, cost of agrochemicals, that's a weedicides, a pesticides, cost of fertilizer itself, cost of harvesting, then we do a cost of cutting and then storage. Mm -hmm. When we did our costing in uh, 2021, we had 1,700 Ghana cities per one acre. If you okay, put so, all those costs So to cost break together, that down, that is what you will need to cultivate an acre? An acre. Of now, whichever crop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but this... That's 1,200. Yeah. No, that was 2021 was 1,700. 700, okay. Now, for 2020, the cost was around 1,200. Okay. So we just finished with our crop budget for 2022, and we got 3,300. Wow. And it makes sense, because let's take a... That's a, a double of yeah, what you used. double of what we had in 2021. If you take the variables, the cost component that we put together, let's just take fertilizer for instance. Mm -hmm. With the government subsidy, in 2020, it was a 32 Ghana cities per 25 kg of NPK. In 2021, we started with 48 Ghana cities per 25 kg. But when government put a figure there, the importers refused to supply because they said that cost was too low compared to when they are importing. That is so we did fertilizer subsidized by Subsidized that. one. So that was adjusted later to 53 Ghana series per 25 kg for the MPK. So what you mean is that when you, the farmer, go to the shop to buy that, yeah. you pay 50... 53 Ghana series. And then you get the bag. You get the bag okay. of the 25 kg. Okay. Now, the prices that were just released by the Ministry of Food and Agri uh, last month suggest that we are buying the 25 kg of MPK, which we used to be... 53 Ghana cities, now for 160 Ghana cities. Wow. For the same thing, more than 200% increase. That is just over from last year to this year? Yes. From 53 to 160 Ghana cities for a 25 kg. Now, even with the, 20, the 2021 cost of production, actually our incomes drastically reduced because the cost was so high. Because of climate change in 2021, you realize that we started a season with very poor mm. rainfall pattern. Um, around the month of uh, August, September, the northern part of the country also experienced some slight flooding. Mm -hmm. So whilst we experienced drought at the beginning of the season, and then we got stability around July to August, mm -hmm. later pa part of August, we had flooding. So those factors actually influence the total productivity that we have now. So that's why when you go to most of the greens market, you talk of a uh, Tumu, which is one of the leading uh, district in terms of a uh, maize in recent times. You go to Techiman, Kintampo, Afran Plains. 
you will not even get the quantity of maize that you want to buy. Availability is a problem. Uh, and uh, the price uh, and is, why is... Why is that? Because of these factors that I've just mentioned. Okay. So, what, how have, so what, t t t explain to me how the, uh, the astronomical increase in the cost of cultivating a farm, an acre, is translating to the shortage. Yeah, the point is that, you see, if you take um, the savanna belt and then even the transitional belt, the soils are very, very poor. So usually when you don't apply the right quantity of fertilizer to support the bare soil, your yields are likely to reduce drastically. Mm -hmm. So when, farming, when cost of production is very high, there are two things farmers can do. Either to reduce their, their, their farm sizes or they cultivate without putting the right quantity of fertilizer on the farm. So last year, we less expected that we were going to experience the shortage that we had. So most farmers actually maintained their farm sizes. So when it was time for fertilizer, majority could not get a fertilizer to apply it. So that affected the yield. And that's why we have the strategies we are experiencing. Now my problem is not even what we are experiencing now. My problem has to do with the double cost of production compared to 2021 and 2022, which will translate into yield per acre or productivity in 2023. Because already I've spoken to majority of our members, the peasant farmers, and also our growers and nucleus farmers, who suggested to me that, look, as a, this is the time for them to prepare their farms. And most of those who are into, especially rice and maize, are telling me that, look, they have to reduce their farm sizes. Rice and maize. Rice and maize, because this is the heavy consumer of fertilizer, these two crops. Now, for the peasant farmers who have options, especially those around the transitional belt. If I talk of transitional belt, I'm talking about Kintempo, Techiman, Nkranza, Wenchi, uh, you take Ejra, because these are also the heavy maize producing areas. They are telling me that, look, they are shifting into producing cassava and yam. So they're abandoning the, the, um, the, the maize, because cassava and yam do not actually need too much, uh, actually do not need fat layer. For northern part of the country, they are looking at going back into granite. Um, others are going to barn barn beans, sweet potatoes. Mm. Because those want to, you don't really need much fertilizer to apply. I see. I mean, Edward Carraway, what, what's, your, what's the story with the, your, your members in the Agriculture Workers Union there? Um, let's look at some of the farming implements that we've talked We've talked about fertilizer already. I think they are obvious from, from, from 53 cities. Yeah. yeah to 160 cities just over a space of a year, that's a significant jump. Well, what, what are your members telling you? Well, the story is the same. Uh, prices of uh, the inputs, that is the major inputs have gone up so high. And um, certainly their incomes have not gone up as much as that. So the net effect is that they would uh, now be able to uh, acquire less of what they used to acquire in terms of the inputs. And what that means is that there'll be, there's the need to cut down your acreage. Mm -hmm. um, the cost of uh, preparing the uh, farmlands have also gone up. And uh, if you have more acreage and yet you are not having enough fertilizer to put in it, uh, the total cost will remain the same, but then you can be guaranteed that uh, total output will, will fall. And um, it doesn't make sense for any rational thinking being to um, foresee that output will fall, yet costs will go up to still continue in that uh, venture. So the overall effect is that they are going to cut down production and then uh, it's, it's, it's just natural. Even if they don't want to cut down product, they don't have the resources to continue to maintain the same acreage as they used to do. So when they cut down production, what will happen? It means that total output for 2022 will fall. And when that falls, the effect will actually be felt in 2023, particularly uh, during the lease season around this time, uh, March, April, May, June, July, where it is the lease season for the country. So this is the effect, uh, 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 what will happen to uh, all of us if the current situation has not changed for the better. So you, you are expecting 
that yeah. this is going to have an impact on uh, availability of food and, and food security for this country? Well, certainly. You know, sometimes you can you look at a policy and you see where it is going to end. The current policy of government is to cut down subsidy on fertilizer. That is from 50% to uh, 50%. Yeah. What I also hear the deputy minister speak is that even the quantity of fertilizer that they intend to you know, supply to farmers under the subsidized uh, policy, that will now be about 50% or not more than 50%. What that means is that from today, as a country, we are through the policy indicating that there will be a shortfall in output at the end of 2022, mm -hmm. you know, and it is the policy that is directing it. And uh, I think that some of the issues should come as latent, unexpected uh, negative effect, but we should not from the day one set a policy to uh, attain a low output at the end of the year. I mean, and I think that I think uh, government should not do because today the policy is clear. And yeah, I mean, but, 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 but to, that point, to that point that you made about government policy, I want to bring in yeah. Dr. Patrick Smith. Doc, yes, so that is government policy now. But from, your, from the way you look at it, from the economics point of view, government hasn't got a choice, has it? In the midst of the global challenges we're facing, the current you know, economic challenges, um, is this the most prudent way to go? Government says that is the only thing they can do. Farmers will have to bear a bit more of the bedding. Uh, good evening, Evans. Uh, sorry, my background is dark. My light just went out. So I think that, you know, we, we obviously face uh, difficult choices uh, as a country at this moment. If you look at where government finances is heading, you, you know that the government has some challenges. But you have to question whether, under the circumstance, food production or interventions that support food production is what we should be cutting. Okay. So I would have expected that, you know, food production is very critical to not just uh, food security, but also some of the programs of the government, like uh, uh, one district, one factory. We need the food production side to provide the input to support those aspects of the program. So. From where I said, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have suggested that we should be cutting the support that we are giving to the farmers through the fertilizers or input subsidies. I think in some part, it has also come about because from the very outset, we haven't, you know, the way we, start, we started with the planting for food and jobs. If you knew that you're going to do such an intervention for an extended period, you could have started by, at the outset, planning to ensure that over the medium term, all your fertilizer inputs are generated locally. Mm. Obviously, part of the challenges we have is that because of you know external factors, COVID started a lot of it started with COVID, but also other factors, we realize that fertilizer prices, first fertilizer availability has reduced globally and fertilizer prices have gone up. And that obviously is part of the reason why the affordability for the government has become a challenge. Yes. But if from the outset we had foreseen that you know, we are going to have to support farmers with fertilizer for a longer time, and we have started building structures to ensure that within three or four years, we are self-sufficient in the production of fertilizers, we probably wouldn't be in a situation like this. And the same applied to some of the agricultural inputs, the key agricultural inputs that the government has been supporting our farmers with. I mean, so, so we, clearly we, we, have, we are in a pickle here because as you, what you're proposing, we haven't done. Um, and do, do we have Francis there on the line because he, he is, supplies the input to the, to the farmers. Um, hello, Francis. Okay, we'll get Francis on because I, I'm curious. So, so government is going to have a shortage, uh, Charles, yeah, about with the supply of the, even the fertilizer they promise you, you're not going to get yeah. all. Yeah. So why are you going to get the rest from? Yeah, so uh, it's so impromptu. I've started talking to 
some fertilizer importers, some are showing signs uh, that they may target the peas and farmers. Uh, but I want to add some few points, even okay. though we are uh, focusing on oil fertilizer. Mm -hmm. The challenge that we faced in 2021 was not only fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And then what we are going to face now is not also only fertilizer. Absolutely. If you look at almost all the factors of production, you know, we used to talk of factors of production, which is land, labor, capital, and now we are talking about input. Apart from uh, land and then even water, the water that we get from nature for free, all, uh, all, all the other um, factors of production has more than quadruple. We decide I, I didn't get time to bring that in. Yeah, I was showing it on television. Yeah. I'm assuming we, it's gone up, the price has gone up significantly. I'm telling you, last year we were buying, uh, let's say, uh, 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 glyphosate. That is uh, the one that we use for non-selective. Around 20 to 25 Ghana cities. Today, I was just talking to one of the Chinese company that used to supply to the farmers, and it's going to 50 Ghana cities. So that's a double. Yeah, that's a double. Uh, you talk of um, the total services. We don't know how it's going to play out because fuel prices have gone up. Have gone up. And most and of you don't own the tractors. You yes, rent it. we rent them. So those who are renting will have to also add on their cost. Mm. Now, we also heard from uh, Ghana Metrological Agencies also talking about... Uh, um, poor rainfall pattern, uh, the rain is not coming on time. Previously, by now, if you go to a place like uh, Techiman, they should have been planting their maize. When you go there, farmers are still preparing their lands and waiting because the rains haven't actually started. I spoke to a number of farmers today who are telling me that they won't do the major season uh, 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 maize because already they don't have enough resources, so they'll do small of the minor season maize. Mm. So, so, so tell me something, in, in terms of the, uh, and then Edward Kyrie talks about the potential for this to lead to some sort of a food crisis, yeah. but from what you've said, we're going to, we, not, not all the food items or the staples will be affected, because sure. farm, farmers are moving, sure. are reducing yeah. focus from other places and yeah. shifting elsewhere. Sure. So which, which particular food items do you expect that we may, we may take a hit? Yeah, the impact is going to be more on maize and rice. Okay. And this... I mean, after the rice, we import yeah. it anyway. So. Yeah, still, but uh, we produced uh, 35%. Percent. And then we made a point that we're going to increase that to 60% this year. Mm. So that won't happen? The 60% increase? Yeah, we have a platform we've been talking, and okay. then we are coming out with our own strategies. Uh, we come to my own suggestion to government. I think uh, uh, Karwe was giving his uh, view. I think uh, we have a nice... Uh, Proposal, I think that governments will consider. But I'll come so, to that so, solution shortly. Yeah. Yes, so, so the crops that are likely to be affected more is the maize and the rice. Okay. And these are staple food that if you take every household yeah. in Ghana, they almost consume them. Yeah, my favorite food is rice. Yeah. How many people actually eat uh, uh, farfara -far potato or mm. sweet potato or, or cassava? Or cassava. Or mm. Even though these are food items with high nutritional value that we encourage people to mm. go in. So those areas we are likely to see improve in production. Now, those ones to have limited impact on industry, like poultry, like uh, Nestle Ghana, sure. like Guinness Ghana, because poultry, they don't need maize, I mean, they don't need yam. So the cereals will be affected. affected? Yeah, the cereals will be affected. So that is what we should be concerned about. Mm. I mean, Edward Carraway, you, you mentioned the, uh, the, the, the government's policy. Is there an understanding among the farmers that what we are experiencing currently, as far as government policy is concerned, is inevitable because of the peculiar economic situation that we find ourselves in? Well, the farmers are clear. They depend on policy. Uh, they wake up one morning to hear that government is saying, look, I am no more interested in subsidizing fertilizer up to 50%. I am limiting it to only 15%. They go to the market, prices of fertilizers have gone up, which is major, and other costs of production have gone up. They are simply helpless, you know, and um, they will still farm after all, in any way, but they will be limited in uh, their 
quest to increase production. You know, and because we are not running an individual economy, we are running a macro economy. We should be interested in mobilizing the micro activities into macro level. And that is where the state comes in very strongly. And the state is key in uh, guiding and directing all of us into the future. Again, policy gives a direction, expectation. Um, we all know that if government is saying that, please, we are going to, for instance, pay more than 50% of the fertilizer that we give to you, then you are simply asking farmers that, please produce, I mean, increase your acreage because inputs will be cheaper, will support you to produce. And then the, the message to the entire Ghanaian populace is that, look, government is working on this and then there will be more food in the, in, in the system. Now, Mr. Carrier, but, I, but isn't that a and question? That, isn't that a question that government simply hasn't got the money to do that now? No, I disagree that government does not have the money. Okay. Um, this is about choices. Simple economics. It's about choices. You 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 have your preference list, and you make your choice among the, them. Government can only say they don't have money for agriculture when they make the decision that they don't have money for agriculture, because they have money for other things. Look, when a, a whole economy is hit by crisis of this nature, you know that you cannot address all the challenges at a go. But there are some critical areas which you need to hold on to. And I think agriculture is one. Look, agriculture is even linked to health. All that we are talking about health and so on will come to naught when people are poorly fed, when people eat the poor food, they will run into many issues. So you don't need to invest more in health more than agriculture because agriculture determines the state of health of the people to some a large extent. So we just have to make the choice and say that look, we are not going to cut down our budget to agriculture, but we'll cut down budget to other areas of the economy. So I'm saying that government has got the money. There is a money in this country, but it has to only be done by the choice. I am not too sure that government thinks like I do and many others do, that we should focus on agriculture for this period that our economy is challenged by so many uh, factors, some within internal factors, some are also external factors. So we need to make choices. So it's a choice. I mean, Dr. Patrick Assuming, is, this, is it that simple? Well, it, it, it obviously is a choice. I, I think at this, at this point in time, we know that we have difficulties and we have to decide, you know, where you know, which sectors mean a lot to us. I don't think, you know, it's, a, it's a, we should see it as, a, we should put more in health and put more in this. I think some, when it comes to agric and food production, it's, it's, it's pretty dicey if you decide to make uh, the kind of choices that it appears that the government is making, because yes, all the other sectors matter, but when, you know, food is such a basic thing, and investment in food has a big part in all the other sectors of the macroeconomy. If you look at what has been happening to inflation numbers since the COVID, the biggest driver has been the food inflation. And you know, when you have an economic crisis and it, it turns into a food crisis, I think it's, it's, it's a more dangerous combination. I think we also, because of what has happened, everything else that has happened with the COVID. So the food here is not just about the agriculture sector and the food production per se. It has a big part to do with our industrialization agenda. It has a big part to do with, as uh, uh, Mr. Carraway has said, uh, providing the nutritional needs of the, of the economy. And it also has a big part to do with broader health. So the food production should be seen as a center of uh, our strategy. And in essence, when the government laid out these programs, you could see that from the beginning, it put more emphasis on the planting for food and jobs. That would be with the understanding that once 
we settle the issue about the food production, we are going to be able to have the raw materials to feed the, in the, the industrialization that we want. So for me, I, I don't think cutting support to food production is a problem, but you can say that it appears that there's been some problems with the design of the support system we've been given. I'm sure we've all heard of complaints about some fertilizers that haven't reached uh, their, you know, their intended beneficiaries and all. Yeah. So it appears that the issues around the process has raised the cost. So perhaps if we dealt with the, you know, the apparent irregularities around the distribution process, maybe we'll be able to cut some of the expenses we make on that and be able to provide more support. But to simply decide to cut it because uh, Obviously, admittedly, the economy is in a, is in a bit of trouble. For me, I don't think that would be the way to go. Okay, so, so, so if that's not the way to go, what, what is the way to go? I mean, um, let me bring you in, uh, Dr. Dr. Nyaba. Yeah. You, you said you, you're making proposals to government. Yeah. I think there's consensus that we are in trouble, yeah. right, with the economy. Um, uh, Dr. Suming says this is not the way to go to cut agriculture. But everything else is taking a cut in a way. I mean, according to the, what we are hearing, finance minister will go to... Uh, parliament soon to announce this on Thursday, but the anticipation is that flagship programs may 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 take a hit. What is the solution then, if not cutting like we've cut fertilizer already? Yeah, so um, for us, yes, I agree with the uh, uh, doctor that uh, there were leakages, there were weaknesses in the implementation of the uh, planting for food and jobs. That but, but is this a planting for food and jobs problem? What no, we are, what we are talking the implementation, about now. we are talking about implementation. Because, uh, but, but the current situation we are just talking about were the challenges with the increasing cost yeah. of production. Is it a planting for them jobs problem? Yeah, it's affecting planting for, if you look at production in general, mm. planting for food and job initiative is the one that all this is, is under. Mm -hmm. So if there's problem in any of those uh, legs, then it affects the entire planting for food and jobs. So the point I'm making is that there were some weaknesses leading to leakages and we were not getting the full benefit of the planting for food and jobs. That doesn't mean that we should reduce budget allocation for planting for food and jobs. What we need to do is to look at the implementation leakages. Such as? Such as uh, the leakages in the fertilizer subsidy program, such as the fertilizer falling in the hands of people who do not actually use the fertilizer. Yeah, but that thing has been going on for years. It hasn't stopped. Yes, so that is what we need to address now, not to reduce the, quantity, uh, the amount that goes into it. By targeting the smallholder farmers who produce about 80% of the food that we eat and then supply to industry. That is the first point. How do you really... target them? Oh, we are there. Last year, ask, uh, I mean, Glowfet is not here. Ask the input suppliers. Last year, we strategically of load the fertilizer from Tema and send it to where our members are located. I was personally there to be sure that the fertilizer goes to the smallholder farmers. Mm. And it worked very well. So, but, but how, how does government do it? How so, do so now the current arrangement is that um, any distributor who has money link up with the importer, take the fertilizer and go and sell and report to government. Okay. So the such instances, you know, our fertilizer because of the subsidies were relatively cheaper than the neighboring countries. Mm. So there were several occasions that these people would take the fertilizer instead of selling it to the Ghanaian farmers, they send it across the border to sell. Okay, so 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 you see, help me understand this the, the process. So I am I am an individual, I have money, I bring my fertilizer, yeah. I, I manage to import my fertilizer. Yeah. Then I sell it to you, the farmer. Okay. And then I go to, is that how, and then I go to no, government. No, so what, what happened is that government actually published for people who want to supply fertilizer under the planting for food and jobs. Mm -hmm. People apply and companies are listed. Okay. So when the companies bring the fertilizer, they also have distributors okay. who work with those companies. So the distributors go and buy the fertilizer. Instead of selling it at a full cost. So they buy fertilizer from those who import the, it. Those who import. So instead of them selling the fertilizer at a full cost, they go and sell at a subsidized cost. Okay. Then they get the, um, the documentation, that the list of farmers, the number of farmers who bought, endorsed by the district director of agri, mm -hmm. regional director of agri, and then the regional minister. Mm -hmm. So when the sales are done, then they submit those invoices to 
the crop directory who also submit to Ministry of Finance. Then the differences is then paid back to, to the, the company. To the company. Yeah. I mean, so, so, so now. I see. So that definitely is a process that is fraught with challenges. Of course. I mean, it, it can easily be, ex be, be exploited. Yeah. So now, what we are saying is that government is already facing challenges mm -hmm. in financing the planting for food and jobs. Mm -hmm. The option is not to cut the budget. The option is to now consider other options. How can we make it possible for people who can afford to get money at a low interest rate? As there are, there are as a lot of... As in borrowing from the bank? Yes. If you take Burkina Faso, let me, let me give you one example. Burkina Faso, for instance, they don't have any subsidy program. But Burkina farmers are able to take loans with government guarantee at 2% interest rate. Wow. So nobody is actually interested in waiting for government subsidy to come before they go in. If you take a Thailand, it's the same thing. The government guarantee for you to go and take the loans with zero interest. Once you are going into agriculture, it could be production, it could be aggregation, it could be marketing. So we are saying that since government have challenges in actually subsidizing large quantities of fertilizers, the subsidy to go to the smallholder farmers. Then the large farmers, aggregators, processors, governments will give them guarantee loans so that those people will be able to go and take the loans with low interest rate. They are able to go to the open market, procure the commodities and produce. Once you do that, you don't really need to all the time overburden yourself with subsidies. But that's what we are not doing. Now there's another area that we need to look at. Now the inputs goes with conducive environment. That is availability of water. We started the one village, one dam. I don't want us to focus only our discussion on fertilizer because yeah, of course, what one, yeah, be on that. one village, one dam is another flagship program. Yes. That is also going to experience this budget cut, mm -hmm. which we are causing government to be very careful with that. Mm. Because already we are getting warning from uh, Ghana meteorological agencies about so you need to store water, the dams are important. Yes, this yes. So we started that, things couldn't go well. So we are thinking that it's an area that we need to also consider. Because the factors that are leading to low supply of food that we are complaining about, it's not only the inputs. It also has to do with the, the rainfall pattern. And many farmers, many people who came to actually invest in the sector have to actually pull up because the weather was not conducive for them. So in going forward, we think that it's an area that we need to consider. Now, in terms of the inputs and the alternatives, we have actually been trying to promote the use of compost mm. and then organic fertilizer. Yeah, but that is in available in abundance. Yeah, it is, because we allow... But you don't need government help to do that, do you? No, but we need some kind of uh, support. How? If you talk about the compost, we have the one that the farmer can prepare, which is in limited quantity. There's one that we need industry to actually, like what uh, Accra Compost we're doing. We need industry to do that in large quantities. Mm. And you know, unlike inorganic fertilizer, which is refined, that you can take uh, some small quantities and carry it across districts to supply. This one is bulk. So we need government to target that for the subsidy. And then also target those industry and give them tax incentives to be able to uh, process these uh, waste materials into some refined compost mm. that we'll be able to adopt. Because if you look at um, what is affecting our inflation and then the city on stability, it's because we are depending almost all the inputs from, 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 from the West. Yeah. But if we begin to produce our own raw material in country, I think it will go a, 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 a long way to reduce the cost of importation. Mm. Seed is another area that we need to are look you importing? at. Are you importing seeds? We import almost all the seeds. Okay. So then seed, you need seed, again you need yes. foreign exchange to do that? No, because if you look at the seed producers, they are not getting any support. Mm. It's very expensive to produce quality seed. You need irrigation. So we are importing you, seeds? We, we importing import, all our seeds? I'm telling you, the local production is far, far below what so, so, so again, tell me about seeds then. How much? How much is? How much is seeds? How much are seeds now? You you buy seeds for your for your? Yeah, we do especially the hybrid seed. Okay, which hybrid, is imported. Yes, which is okay. imported. Most of the, I'm imagining that will definitely be affected by the action rate situation. Of course. I mean, and so that is give uh, me a now, sense of now, what the, what the yeah. cost is. Now let me let me make that clear. That is for 
crops like maize, soya, sorghum, and the vegetables. Okay. For rice, I think we are doing well. Okay. Uh, we have um, uh, most of our farmers being able to do rice seed, but they are also facing challenges. Mm. So because of that, if you look at the quality of the rice seeds that we have in country, it's no good at all. So, so give me a sense of how much is, is, is it costing you now to, to buy seeds? Yeah, so if you take um, hybrid uh, maize, let's take uh, Pioneer for instance. Uh, last year, we were buying between 600 Ghana cities for one acre. Okay. Yeah. Then when you take um, um, rice, it was around 150, 160 okay. for one acre for the seed. Now, my problem is not only about the cost. It's also about the quality. And the quality has to do with the cost of producing the seed. So, so you're giving the last year price. What is it this year? Has it changed or is it the same? Yeah, so this year the seed price is not, I haven't actually received Checked, okay. that yet. Yeah, I have to check mm. that. But if you take, um, um, I think I would like to cross check yeah. and give you let, the let, let, me, let, me, yeah. let me get Edward Kairi's thoughts on, so, so Edward, you say the solution is not in cutting the, um, the, the help and assistance to, to agri sector. If, if that is not a solution, what, what is your proposal then? Well, first and foremost, we need to make sure that the leakages within the agriculture sector are blocked. It's like having a leaking uh, uh, bucket or uh, container, and you continue to pour water into it. All will leak out. And it's clear that all the, the, the inputs, the fertilizer and so on, that we import into this country, and the ministry's own uh, uh, claim that they are being smuggled out. So, and the thing, most worrying part of it is that that there's a, an innovative, you know, uh, uh, a novel way of doing this smuggling through donkeys. Donkeys. Well, is, yes. And then, because of that, because they are no human beings, uh, the state has cannot do anything to them because they cannot arrest them. You know, it is, it is unacceptable. So, whilst we are calling for them to, government to maintain and even increase uh, support to the agriculture sector, we are not saying that without cognizance to the fact that there are leakages. And we are saying that you must plug those leakages. This is our point. You must plug those leakages. Otherwise, subsidy is a developmental tool. You need it from time to time. Even the developed countries, they do subsidize even at this stage of their development. Why not a country like Ghana? Because and you see, don't have money to subsidize. No, no. Subsidy does not necessarily mean that you must cough out money. Look at what government is doing with the uh, benchmark value policy. You are subsidizing imports. To the extent that you are subsidizing imports that are injurious to your domestic production, to your domestic producers, this is what we think is not appropriate. So it is not about money. It is about where you want to put your money. So we can subsidize agriculture, but we have, must have a target. When are we exiting the subsidy? It is not for government to get up one day and tell us that, look, we are no more going to subsidize fertilizer up to 50%, but we are going to do it uh, uh, 15%. No, we have gone past that stage of governance whereby when uh, 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 government officials think that they are the only people to decide what should happen. You know, the, 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 the administrative system and governance system within the agricultural sector, which is exclusive of any other, you know, uh, um, stakeholders, is not helping. The minister alone cannot do it. So this is the way to go. Okay. You have a synergy. Respect the other stakeholders. Sit down with them. Because in any case, what is this subsidy meant for? It is meant to benefit the farmers. Yeah. So are they not beneficiaries? Why do you take off the subsidy, reduce it to 15% without sitting down with the farmers to see whether or not that is the appropriate le yeah, level I mean I mean, let me bring in Dr. Smith very quickly as, as we wrap up. You have said earlier that you will not cut support to the agri sector. Um, uh, we've had the suggestions about um, cutting, the, the, preventing the leakage. 
but if that that definitely cannot be because we, we are in this, we we agric we, we need to address this here and now and that sounds like a long-term solution to the problem in the short term what, what can government really do because the government hasn't got the money well yeah i'll start by saying that i mean you and i when we don't have money the first thing we we don't do is to say there'll be no food in the house so i, I think it's, it's right that we the, the government needs more money you will say we should raise more revenue that's going to take a little bit of time but whatever we do in the short term we have to learn lessons from what the COVID has taught us and that is that there are some critical things that we cannot continue to depend on imports at the beginning i said that we have to have a strategy for making sure that we reduce we, we, our we could get the inputs so, locally yes you mean okay. exactly so so that's a big part and then like my colleagues have said the leakages will take a little bit of time but if we made the spending more efficient if because with what we've done even if we cut it and the leakages are still there the small amount that is left with there will still be leakages so yeah. the impact will even be compounded so whether it is a one-day fix or a three-year fix we should start now okay trying to find alternative strategies to okay. ensure that uh, we plug in the loopholes gentlemen, we, we thank, you the loopholes. gentlemen thank you very much let's uh, let's hope so let's hope that the prediction prediction that the food crisis might happen uh, indeed are vetted as we hear the finance minister hopefully on thursday maybe with a solution uh, for uh, dr charles nyabai and co i'm grateful for joining me Thank <laughs> you.